Hello, my name is Vincent, and I'm going to be talking today about immutable auto-updating infrastructure for edge use cases. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Vincent. I'm CTO at Kenfolk, still very much a uh, programmer and individual contributor. You can find me on GitHub, Twitter, or by email, vbats at all these places. So a little bit about Kenfolk. Kenfolk is for five years deep Linux and Kubernetes experts um, working from the kernel up the stack through, you know, init system D container runtimes and into Kubernetes. Um, feel free to get in touch with us. But these days, a lot of what folks know us for is flat car container Linux. So let's dive into the path we're going to take today. Um, it's important to kind of first and think through why and how containers helped get us here. Um, Part of this particular strategy that is our focus is flat car container Linux, an optimized use case, and then how these things come together for the edge use case. So in containers in general, you'll see here the uh, actual train car that's underneath these shipping containers is a flat car, um, but specifically for in general the theoretical side of containers. Um, they have, you know, been talked about, and it, you know, it's been a lot of work done. And there's, you know, infrastructure that supports the infrastructure at this point. Um, so some of these use cases almost feel like your head is in a bubble, uh, this cloud native bubble. Uh, so a little bit of what today, you know, is talking about how to push further into the real world use cases as we see this market adoption curve move from innovators, early adopters, into the early market and then so forth. Like how, how do these technologies actually make a, a difference in running applications for us? So the, the great idea of containers, you could say that they've been around for 15 years, almost 16 years at this point, but containers as most people know them and have had their hands on them have been around for about the last seven years. And they revolutionized what was theory or, you know, kind of like very narrow use cases into you know, day in, day out. This is, you're going to boot up, you know, a machine for the first time and be able to run applications in isolation, uh, possibly even without you knowing it, that, you know, your browser or your chat client is in a container of some kind. But the big thing is that with that became that they're so ubiquitous and not just ubiquitous for certain parts of the community, like developers or people who, you know, expect to get their hands dirty, but now we just need something that's enterprise supportable, or, you know, I just need the docs to be written well enough that anybody can put their hands on it. And it's on the versions that are generally available, uh, you know, whatever software I'm using, that they're available everywhere. The other big focus for me is kind of the deployment model and how it forced our APIs and like how you interact with applications, even traditional applications, um, to say, well, you have you know a certain writable directory. It might be mounted to a volume somewhere, but here's your writable directory. Don't expect to write anything anywhere else. Um, there might be certain ports that are exposed, and you know like these kind of characteristics, or even getting down to the capabilities and all this other stuff. But it, it kind of pushed forward that piece of it. The other side of that is that. No longer did we have to say, um, yeah, not just the works on my machine, but kind of the, at the time when I tested it, all the versions of all the dependencies that were going to get installed were just right. And from that moment to the time when it deployed in production, somebody updated something that fit into the dependency tree, you know, but it resolved differently once you want to install those packages on the production environment. You know, all the ways that we had contrived to lock it down to what you deploy is exactly what you expect to or spend weeks in deployment and, you know, fig figuring out how you made this new snowflake. That's kind of like front loaded now. You, you get that container built right and now you have effectively a statically linked runtime that you can deploy uh, in your production environment. And then what actually runs those things, what actually executes them, whether it's like talking Docker, container D, cryo, or particularly I like to focus on like the run C, C run, you know, 
G-Visor Kata container piece of it. Like, do you need micro VMs? What, what's your use case? And so you can change those things out without having to change that statically linked application stack. Um, and those, those are um, the kind of concepts that have been brought from theor theory into practice with containers. Along that same evolution, we have Flatcar Container Linux. It began um, in 2018 as a friendly fork of CoreOS Container Linux. CoreOS Container Linux began in 2013-ish, and it, it brought it pushed forward a new kind of like maybe we don't need a general purpose Linux for everything. Maybe by trimming down those APIs and kind of forcing that conversation to which APIs do you even need for deploying an application on top of a, of a host. Um, it kind of pushed that same kind of conversation, but for the underlying piece of where those containers are going to live. And so core, as of this past May, CoreOS Container Linux was end of life. And now in September 2020, a lot of those assets are disappearing off the internet. So Flatcar uh, while it's two years old and is running, you know, byte for byte compatible as a, you know, drop-in replacement, is now the upstream for being uh, container Linux. The big focus for this concept is that it's a minimal operating system. Once you say, I just need to be able to run containers really well, what is what is it kind of like the don't break user space agreement that the kernel has? What is it for like don't break container space for a container host? And so you can start trimming away a lot of pieces of that you can focus on, you know, just reducing your attack surface, you know, reducing your management surface and making it very easy at that. So these update payloads are in around the 500 uh, megabyte um, target. And so the host itself runs on kind of a hot and cold A side, B side. Um, partitioning scheme for this immutable part. So it's running and it takes an update in the background and puts it to the cold side and then schedules itself for a reboot. And when it reboots, it's there and there's a, you know, you can roll back to the other if it's not right. That, that process happens atomically. So it's not that it says, oh, hold on, let's recompute the dependency tree and pull down a bunch of metadata and figure out how to, you know, which packages even need updating, whatnot. You, you don't have Snowflake hosts like that anymore. It just pulls that underlying operating system update and you know you work it out on how you update. By default, like I said, the machines will just take the update and reboot within about five minutes. So with a lot of the container workloads, this is gonna, going to just reboot and your volumes and whatever else need to remount and your containers will restart and should not have an issue. And this is this is kind of like, again, one of the APIs and interfaces that containers have pushed forward in the years. Um, working with legacy applications that is not always the case. So there's times when you need to schedule that or, um, you know, new greenfield applications are now thinking about these problems of like the host and the environment that you're running in might take a reboot without your knowledge. How do you come back up in a safe way or take a graceful shutdown? Um, there's even like a flat car Linux update operator that you can run on your Kubernetes cluster to be able to let the node itself, you know, handle draining and scheduling itself for a reboot. So there's lots of options there. And now as we are reducing these kind of snowflakes, um, the machines is, is, is whatever your target is, bare metal, cloud, otherwise, that you you know as soon as you have it then you can provision the container linux ready for use and then start scheduling your applications with whatever stack is being put on top of there all these automated updates they do come in different channels um, we have an alpha a beta and a stable so obviously alpha is going to take a lot of churn it's not just alpha in the sense of like new unre you know barely released software this is just alpha in the sense of where changes land first. Um, it'll take updates and then you'll have beta. Beta will have less churn, but you should run some of your you know, staging and otherwise in beta so you see what's upcoming. And then stable will take you know, least amount of updates, whether they're 
um, security updates or version bumps that have been baked through all the other channels. So let's do jump over to a quick demo. Here I've got uh, Equinix Metal, which formerly Packet up, and we'll do a quick test here. We'll choose Alpha for no good reason. And I'm going to add in a little bit of like cloud init type config, and I'll walk through what's involved in that. So real quick, I'm going to stop this locksmith service so that we can see that some something is deployed. Might not be, you know, due to the bare metal provisioning, what they've staged might be a day or two out of date, and that's fine. The machine would take a reboot within about five minutes anyways. Uh, because we're going to install Kubernetes, um, there's it's not writable to the slash user partition. Uh, we're going to make and mount a overlay on uh, that libexec, and then lastly, we'll do the curl pipe to bash for K3S with a few environment variables to say install to this bootstrap directory on the host. And let's kick that off. And for giggles, let's come over here to EC2, and we will do the same kind of thing. All kinds of noises. Looks great. Yeah, we'll go with an A1 medium for any good reason. Paste the same thing in there. Review and launch. Sounds great. where we are over here. No, that one's not up yet. That's fine. All right, we're going to come back here. I like this out of band console. It makes me feel like back when you're actually sitting in front of a computer that's getting installed, watching it post in the BIOS and everything. these things just a second to settle. Let's And so how does this all relate to the edge use case? Um, you, you know, edge, edge is a lot of, the word is, you know, overloaded and overused and it's a lot of things to a lot of people, um, whether you're talking about IoT or kind of like getting into things that are not, a, you know, not centralized anymore and they're not unlimited, like bandwidth isn't unlimited and memory is not unlimited and um, even power might not be unlimited, but, you know, you still have to have deployable applications. You still have to have, you know, compute that's schedulable. Um, you still need a lot of deterministic, you know, predictability of how how is the underlying host doing? You know, how can it take few and very predictable updates and then the applications that are scheduled on top of it. Um, so the, the concept's been talked about for a long time, but there's a paper that you know, I called back called back to and bonkers that it's, you know, I remember 1997, 23 years ago, but you can see this timeline even if it was stretched out till today, it, it's a lot of the same cycle that we're familiar with. That you had the the large machines, and then the cycle of like the small microcomputer, whether that's a you know personal PC or whatever. But overall, you have the trend line of 
things are getting smaller, you know, and more more accessible and lighter weight and otherwise. And they have completely different hardware demands. But um, the large computer is not going away. It's just changing in its placement or the use cases. So for a lot of us, that's very familiar. I mean, like whether you ever put your hands on some large rack or if you're just, you know, having that server that's set in the clo- you know, corner of your office in a, in a closet, but now you're moving things out to a cloud that might have higher uptime, but it might also, you know, have some things that you have to kind of get used to how it gets scheduled and how updates happen to it or if it ever is taken offline or something like that. And then, of course, you have like the laptops and the small uh, kind of prototype boards. Um, this is something that we're very familiar with. And you see these these kind of like mass migrations or whatever, like, you know, the, the hardware comes in and it gets popular for different reasons, which then likewise, it goes on, to, the paper goes on to talk about the the corresponding cycles of whether the compute that is happening is centralized or decentralized. And so these these kind of like inverted cycles of popularity, but the big thing to notice, you know, whether this line ends at 1997 or extends till today, is that you see these, there's an upward trend in like the presence of these types of compute, whether they're centralized or decentralized. Um, you know, whether you're sitting in the in the server room or you're at a dumb terminal, whether you have a personal computer or a local server, whether you have, you know, a little bit of internet and some APIs, but things are processed on the machines versus you have now APIs where most is processed in the clouds and the machines are just kind of accessing it and still can kind of do some local processing, but it's offloaded as much as possible. Um, and so this is back and forth and now, you know, as the edge is pushed out to places where it's, you know, power and bandwidth and memory is not unlimited, that this is largely just an extension of cloud. Edge is an extension of cloud. And um, so how do, how do these particular, you know, without being too theoretical about what this buzzword is and what it means, because it, it, it means a lot of things, but but particularly... Things have to stay smart, and we can't just develop and, cons- and, and assume that platforms um, will always have, you know, can take updates and resolve dependencies. And, you know, things should be deterministic because the machines running it will be powerful enough and have fast enough internet to resolve it. They kind of have to be smart. So now when you have a cluster like a flat car with container like K3S on top of it, cluster, that the update that the operating system takes should be minimal. And in some of our deployments, even the application payload that's running on top is a local to that cluster update service so that the update payload is pulled down once, cached, applied, and then made available for that local cluster so that, you know, even if it is a single time 500 meg payload, that doesn't require a lot of metadata to you know do dependency resolution. It, it it can pull it once and reapply it, and that's as minimal as possible. Uh, and the same hope is for like container registries that would fetch down and cache it locally, so that you don't have n number of you know instances fetching it, but rather being smart about how those those instances fetch it and pull it down. Um, and this is using what we already have and carrying it forward into these, you know, smart and useful use cases. So real quick, let's jump over to our machines and see where they are. Looks like this one's almost done. We will see here. Okay, yeah, the Equinix Metal machine is booting up. Right away. Copy its IP address down. So it does an early boot. You saw what looked like a login prompt there. It actually does a an early boot where, uh, like in the net ramifus, where it can apply these things and even 
like for if you did an ignition profile that that's when you could actually change the even uh, partitioning of the host and otherwise and then it boots into the full stack so here we'll nice reused IP address Doggo saying hello. Cool. So you'll notice here that this machine um, oh, did two things at once. Right, so you'll notice here that this machine is on version 2632 and and also part of, like I mentioned that cloud init earlier, that, that uh, we were installing K3S in the background. So that should be, looks like already up and running. And all right, so that is up and running, very cool. And now let's, just a real quick example from a known <laughs> a known demo uh, to stand up a not so simple boutique application um, using like microservices and whatnot. And this is a pretty great demo. You can look at uh, the GCP microservices demo for it, but it'll stand up a full boutique. Take just a second to get consistency on that. The fun part is that while that's going, let's get to this update engine hmm. client and we'll actually run update. And so it is checking in the background for an update. And you'll see here that it actually sees that, you know, I said a second ago we're on the host is on version 2632. Well, it sees that there's actually an update available. And since I'd told it to like not reboot immediately, um, I'm manually kicking this off just so you can see that piece of it. But in the background, it's now already at 32% downloading. And this is applying it in the background. Actually, I can cancel that and go back and check on our application. All right, there's our port. Oh. Cool, our boutique's already up on, online. Let's see what our status is on this client. Oh, it's already finished, updated, needs reboot, update succeeded, needs reboot. If I do nothing, well, normally it would be within five minutes, but it's lock, the locksmith service that I turned off for the sake of the demo. So I, you can see me do this um, myself, and I'll reboot it. And as quick as the machine reboots, then our application should come right back up. And then um, over here, the fun part is that that same exact copy and paste of the cloud net that deployed over on the um, Equinix Metal machine, um, that same piece runs over here. So we have uh, kubectl resources with the whole. of the machine rebooting. 
one of the fun things I love is when it takes its update, especially when it first starts, you just see that quick little spike. The machine's only been on for a second and it pulls down an update if it is needed and then it's off to the races. Is here. Since I specified the AMI directly, that the ARM machine is on that latest one straight away. And Prove my demo wrong here. Oh, I forgot that I still had the status up. Should have been looking at that for a second. There we go. So, that K3S service that we had installed, the installer only ran once, but here the uh, service itself is was it activating. And all that other, all the different pieces are running. And sure enough, refresh and our application is still up and online. conclude so thank you I'm be happy to take some questions uh, and otherwise reach out to me if you have any questions